I promise this is the last talk I give, so. And <laughs> I also promise it's gonna be a, a little less weird than the previous one. <laughs> so, so actually, what I'm talking about here is uh, largely coming from these two papers that I wrote with two of my students in, uh, last, this year and last year. And uh, the idea behind it is that, okay, let you know, look at this kind of mean plus algebras, which are also known as tropical semi-rings, you know, for those who want to see them in terms of tropical geometry and things like that. So basically, you, know, you take the real numbers, you know, we completed that with, with infinity, and the operation you, you use, instead of the usual addition and multiplication, you use the operations that uh, have the minimum as your addition, which has infinity as identity, and uh, they have the usual addition as multiplication, with zero as identity. And you know, this um, has some nice properties, like the usual operation. They, they are associative, commut commutative. You have a left and right identity, which are the ones that I mentioned. And the product distri distributes over the sum. However, it's a semi-ring because you don't have additive inverses, and uh, the addition is idempotent. X, x plus x is x itself. And so that you know, these these mean plus algebras have a lot of applications. You know, that uh, I'm not going to talk about for reasons of time. But what I'm going to talk about is um, a, a kind of natural kind of deformations of these uh, of these structures where you you leave the multiplication meaning the usual addition untouched but you deform the addition and you deform it according to a certain you know, entropy functional and so call these things uh, thermodynamic semi rings and uh, the, the the way the addition is deformed by replacing it, the addition, the, the tropical addition, uh, the minimum, is by replacing it with this kind of minimum over you know, the, the interval 0, 1, you know, P is a, a binary probability distribution, and uh, so you, you average the X and Y, and, but then you, you subtract, subtract a quantity that depends on your chosen binary information measure and a, a thermodynamic parameter, which is an inverse temperature, this uh, beta. So when beta goes to infinity, so when you go to zero temperature, this recovers the unperturbed you know, uh, idempotent addition. It gives you back the minimum of x and y. And it, otherwise, it gives you something different, but which is in this one parameter deformation. So these kind of things were, were considered you know, in, in relation to the geometry of the, the field with one element, things like that, by Kohn and Consani, the special case where this entropy functional is the Shannon entropy. And what happens in the particular case where you take the, the Shannon entropy, is that the, so the Shannon entropy has an axiomatic characterization, the Kinchin axioms, and in particular, this can be recovered just by knowing the, the, the binary case, and the, the properties, the, the axiomatic properties that you require for the binary case are the symmetric property, the fact that you have minima as zero and one, and the extensivity property over, subs over independent subsystems. And these, these properties, which are actually enough to determine the Shannon entropy up to a, 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 a constant factor, correspond to algebraic properties of this deformation of the mean plus semi-ring, and they, they correspond exactly to requiring that the new addition, the deformed addition, is commutative, has a, a left and right identity, and is associative. So it, it's another way of uh, classifying, as another way of determining axiomatically the Shannon entropy by saying it's that deformation that remains commutative and associative and with unit. And so you can, moreover, extend this to n forms, 
just by repeating this operation over n variables, you no know, summing, summing n variables over the these in these deformed semi rings, and the usual you you get you no know, the usual Kinchin axioms in terms of uh, well continuity, maximality, and, and uh, this usual extensivity property, and how it behaves when you add another dimension. You can actually you know, re reconstruct them in terms of the, of the binary measures. You know, construct the n case in terms of the binary measure, which is exactly you know, adding up n. n elements. All right, uh, let's see what happens. Um, so let, let me mention this fact that in the particular case where S is the, the Shannon entropy, you can also write in a convenient way the, mod, the, the modified the, the addition, which is this, this minimum with S, now S over there is the, is the Shannon entropy, you can repackage it so that it becomes this uh, simple expression with the log and the exponentials. Right? So that's, that's another way to see that this deformation when, when the, you go to zero temperature gives you back the, the minimum, the, the usual idempotent addition. So I'll mention that because I'll use it later in, in, so in a, to keep that in mind and it will be useful a little bit down the line. But you can do the same kind of deformation with other information measures. Like for example, you can do it with Rennie entropy. What happens with that? Well, it's still commutative, it's still unital, and it, the, the associativity is weakened, and the, 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 the transformation, the sort of associator that uh, you know, tells you by, by how much you are off with the, with the associativity property is the map that um, switches the P1 and P3 of a, of a, of a triple of, uh, of uh, probabilities. <coughs> so, again, you know, the, the, the way this gives you back a sort of axiomatic characterization of the Rennie entropy by specifying these algebraic properties of the corresponding semi, the form semi ring, and there's a unique solution to that, which is uh, the Rennie entropy. And it, you, know, you can, in particular, look at case, also at cases of non-extensive thermodynamics, where you know, it, it, it doesn't, they don't satisfy the, extens the usual extensivity property of the subsystems. And you, know, you can think, so if, if we think in terms, for a moment in terms of a kind of a physical picture of what is going on, when you take this kind of a addition in these deformed semi-rings, in way, what you are doing is like you're, you're mixing you know, uh, particles or, or systems that have different potentials, and uh, you're effectively you know, computing the, 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 equilibrium, uh, the, the equilibrium value of the free energy for the resulting system. That, that's what this operation, this deformed operation is doing in uh, in terms of physical system. So when you, when you do the sort of extensive cases, you expect that you know, the co independent subsystem combine additively. And if you do non-extensive deformation, like the Salis entropy, you know, then you would have a correction term to this, uh, to the, this additivity of subsystems. And in particular, if you take the, this thermodynamic deformation for the Salis entropy, you find that, um, again, there's a, you have commutativity, unitarity, uh, but you have a sort of deformed version of associativity. You, know, you have associativity only after taking powers, alpha powers, or, or, and not, not with the original. So it's, again, it characterizes uniquely the Salis entropy by these algebraic properties of the corresponding deform thermodynamic semi-ring. So the, the general idea is that you can transform 
various kind of axiomatic characterization of various entropy functional into algebraic properties of the corresponding thermodynamic deformation of mean plus algebras. There's a kind of uh, operatic picture behind the scene in the sense that you, know, you if you can, so an entropy functional should be a collection of probabilities, so it should well, uh, be a functional defined on a collection of probabilities on finite sets, so you have simplices in, in, um, in, simplices in all possible dimensions, and you have a way of combining the probability by you know, composing subsystems, and you have a functional that uh, you know, behave, so the, the, you know, uh, is defined over these this collection of systems, and you, you can you know, uh, formulate this composition of subsystems in terms of this kind of uh, um, operad type compositions. And if you do that, then these, these algebras, that be this, this thermodynamic semi-ring, become algebras over this entropy operad in the sense that they you know, behave according to this composition of, uh, of, the, of subsystems in a consistent way. So I, I'm just you know, sketching this briefly. I mean, the, it's, it's sort of related to work that Tobias Fries has been doing with uh, John Bias and Leinster on, on this uh, operatic point of view on, on entropy. And he's done a, a lot of nice work on that as well. Um, there's a, there's other so the, so far I, I was only looking at like classical entropy functionals, but you can also ask what how you can fit quantum you know, versions into this picture. For example, how you can fit the von Neumann entropy rather than the Shannon entropy. So on mean plus algebras, you also have matrices and traces. And matrices are constructed the way you, know, you expect, so the, the addition of matrices is the component-wise minimum, and the multiplication of matrices is defined according to the usual formula, but replacing sum and products with you know, mean plus sum and products. And, uh, and you have a trace, which is defined as the sum in the, in the mean plus sense of the diagonal entries. And you can introduce a, so this is what one usually calls the tropical trace. You can introduce an entropical trace, which is you know, deformed according to an entropy functional. And just doing in the same way, so, in, if you, in, so that if you have a diagonal matrix, this would actually be the deformed addition that I you know, defined before. So the way to do that is to use the usual ordinary trace and take a minimum over the density matrices, but correct it with a certain entropy functional defined on density matrices. So it's exactly the same idea as before, but instead of deforming the addition, you are deforming the trace on, uh, on matrices. And in particular, the case of the von Neumann entropy then becomes rather in, you know, nice to write. It's, you can express it in terms of the uh, kullback leibler divergence, so it, you, you, can, you can write that you know, deformation in terms of, uh, of, of this relative entropy with respect to this kind of density matrix. And so the, the bottom line is that the, this entropical trace deformed according to the von Neumann entropy becomes the, the, the almost free energy for for this partition function, where A is the, the you know, observable of which you are computing this deformed trace. So it kind of fits you know, with this physical picture behind what, what these deformations mean. And so let me now you know, flash back to very quickly to another thing. Um, so there's a which has apparently nothing to do with what I just said, but no, it's, uh, I'm, the connection is coming in a moment. You know, the, there's a very nice mathematical formulation of renormalization in, uh, in quantum field theory, which uh, is, goes back to Kohn and Kramer about 10 years ago, and um, is based on 
arranging, so in, in you know, quantum field theory, you have Feynman diagrams. For each Feynman diagram, you have some kind of divergent integral, and you want to you know, subtract infinities in a consistent way. So the, there's two main ideas. You organize the, these graphs into an algebraic structure, a half algebra, and you organize the sort of target, so the, integ the integrals that you, these divergent integrals that you're computing for each graph, you organize them uh, in uh, some ring of, of Laurent series or some, some you know, where the, the divergent correspond to hit in a pole of some, or some, some ring of functions that you, know, you want to hit as the target of your, the computation of your Feynman integrals. And then the subtraction of infinities that gives the renormalization is the Birkhoff factorization of you know, morphism of commutative algebras from your Hopf algebra to this target algebra. And you know, this uh, uh, kind of reformulates in a nice mathematical way what physicists talk about as a Bogolubo, Parashup, Hep, Zimmerman renormalization procedure. So you have this you know, Hopf algebra of graphs. You know, it's, uh, it, as an algebra, it's just a commutative, a polynomial algebra on graphs, graphs with some restrictions, but let me just like, ignore that for the moment. What is you know, interesting and uh, non-trivial is the coproduct. The coproduct is the thing that you know, extracts subgraphs and takes quotient graphs. You know, in, uh, in this polynomial part, it has subgraphs and quotient graphs. And um, this, this is how you organize the graphs. The point of this is that you know, in, in renormalization, you have to worry about subdivergences. So you know, not only extract, you know, eliminate uh, divergences, but also consistently eliminate all the subdivergences. So you need to keep track of all the subgraphs and the quotient graphs at the same time. That's why the coproduct is organized to do that. And the target has another structure. So the target is also a commutative algebra. And so you will have a morphism of commutative algebras that goes from one to the other. But so the, the source has this additional structure, which is a coproduct. And the target has an additional structure, which is a Rotobaxter operator of weight minus one, which is basically like pole subtraction in a Laurent series. Pole subtraction has exactly this algebraic property. So this is any algebraic function that has the same flavor as pole subtraction. And you know, then you take a, say, the morphism of algebras, and you know, which in principle doesn't know that you have a Hopf algebra on the left and this Rotobaxter structure on the right. But um, you use these two additional structures to factor it out into two pieces. Factorization is sort of inductive over pieces of lower degree in the, in, in the coproduct. And, um, the, so you use the coproduct to produce this factorization, and you use the, this Rotobaxter operator on the other side to, use the, to produce this factorization. And the point is that this factorization is multiplicative, so bo both, both parts are still morphism of commutative algebras. That's where you need this weight minus one uh, uh, Rotobaxter operator. Okay, so what, what has this to do with anything that I said before? <laughs> okay, so. Um, just recently, a few years ago, Manin proposed a, a program to ad adapt some of these renormalization techniques to problems in the theory of computation where you also have infinities. They're infinities of a different nature than in quantum field theory. They're not the divergent Feynman integrals. They are divergent computational times. And so it, the idea would be to do a kind of factorization like this to extract computationally finite parts from uh, you know, divergent computations. I won't get into the details, but um, what I want to say is that the one of the main problem is that if you want to set up this program, you need to adapt this Birkhoff factorization to th things that have values in mean plus algebra, not in, uh, in commutative algebras as the usual renormalization that I described before of cohn -Kreimer. So you need a kind of Birkhoff factorization in mean plus algebras and possibly in, in their deformations if you know, that I described before. So um, the, the idea is that you know how to do it in ordinary commutative rings 
and you want to extend it to semi-rings. And the way to go from one to another is a kind of logarithmic function. So I um, should kind of skip a few things. Is it on a time? But you know, the, basically, instead of a, a, a you know, morphism of commutative algebras, now you have something that uh, has the multiplicative property, but when you, now you have the, the, the addition, that which is the, the mean plus multiplication. So it's like, you, know, you want to look at your, whatever you had in the spirit of factorization, you want to look at it at the level of orders of magnitude. So what the mean plus algebra is, is the algebra of orders of magnitude. If you have you know, a, a variable that's going to zero, you know, the, the, the minimum is the way that the, the, the sum goes, the, the order of magnitude of the sum, and uh, the addition is the order of magnitude of the product. So sum and product go to mean when you pass two orders of magnitude. And so if you just do that, you find that there is a, a way to set up you know, the, the same kind of Birkhoff factorization with the mean plus operations instead of the, the usual operations of a, a, a ring. And you also have a notion of Rotabaxter structures of, of various ways, which are the same Rotabaxter identity that you have, but just replacing the, the mean plus operations instead of the usual ones. And the, you, you can show that there is a way to construct a factorization for, mean, for a Birkhoff, so for um, Rotabaxter structures of weight one rather than weight minus one. And you know, the, the difference is because you don't have additive inverses in the, in the semi-ring, so you cannot move things across equalities. So there, there's this little twist in the story. And, um, but otherwise, you know, it's, uh, it's, the argument in a sense is similar, except that, so it does require the associativity and commutativity of the mean plus addition. So when you deform it to this uh, deformation, it forces you to use the Shannon entropy in the deformation. Uh, provided you deform according to the Shannon entropy, you do have a, a deformed version of the, so it, you deform along with the deformation of the semi-ring, you deform the Rotabaxter structure as well, and uh, you deform the, the factorization in such a way that it, it's uh, logarithmically related to a factorization in, a, in an ordinary ring. So it's compatible with what one knows from the, from the usual case, and it's compatible with the, when you go to zero temperature with the mean plus operations. And um, it, gives you, it gives you a good version of a Birkhoff factorization. So I'm already running out of time. So well, let me maybe get to apply to something. So um, for example, this gives you some um, operations, for example, on wheat rings. So wheat rings have a addition that is the usual product of formal power series and multiplication that is determined by that, completely determined by that identity. And you have a, a Rotabaxter structure, which is defined on, uh, you know, by a kind of convolution product. You know, this convolution product is, uh, sorry, is the usual uh, product of uh, power series. There's a, here. And you can do Birkhoff factorization with, uh, with, this, with respect to this um, with respect to this Rotabaxter structure, and you find that the, um, it corresponds to taking a convolution product with the multiplicative unit. Well, no, it's not the unit with respect to this operation, it's the unit with respect to the multiplication in the width ring. And this, for example, gives you a nice operation on, uh, you know, Hasseweil zeta functions of varieties of a finite field, where you take a convolution product with the zeta function of spec of the field. And very quickly, to come back to Manin's um, idea, you know, in, uh, in the case of a computation, if you think of graphs uh, being like the flow charts of your computation, 
and you have a, like a, a, a class of machines that you know, perform computations on these graphs, and they can either output or they can run forever. And you you can do the, you, I mean, you can construct a rotabaxter operator of weight one that somehow compares computations on on subgraphs by all these family of machines. And what can happen is that you might have one of the machines that doesn't stop on one of the graphs, but you, the, your renormalization procedure in this sense locates subgraphs for which, so locates where the source of infinity is, is happening. So it's either you know, a, some subgraph where, where that machine does not halt, I mean, does not run forever, where, where it outputs something, so it identifies pieces of the graph where the computation stays finite, and, or, and, and where all the previous machines stay finite. So it's a, it's a way, in a sense, like uh, Manin suggested, of trying to extract from uh, computations that don't halt, sub-computations that halt, and, and sub-machines that, that halt. So at the same time, does both of these things. Okay, uh, maybe I'll don't go through the next example, I just, so this is sort of the motivation. I mean, the motivation is this kind of uh, trying to import some of these physical techniques that come from quantum field theory into the theory of computation and trying to use these mean plus algebras and their deformation to carry out the same kind of argument that you do with Feynman diagrams in, in quantum field theory. Okay, sorry for being. 